Today we're going to be talking about an article by Yoshide et al. Comparative Genomics of Tardigraves, and I'm not going to try to pronounce those. Um, it's in PLOS Biology, and it's new enough that they don't actually have a page number for it. And um, as uh, is more and more of science these days, it's actually available online. You can read the original article yourself. And not just the article itself, but the supplementary material. Um, there's a summary that they have guided, although not dictated, that's found at thescientist.com. And again, that's uh, online. And uh, for those of you who get the newsletter, all you have to do is click on the links, and those are the two articles we uh, sent out. Uh, there'll be a couple more links, uh, which will be here, and if you're looking at this on the web eventually, why you'll be able to pause it and, and copy down the links, or maybe if we are lucky, we'll put it down below as well. So that all you have to do is point and click. And uh, the summary of the summary that they gave is um, genomic analysis leaves tardigrade phylogeny unclear. This is, in their thinking, the main point of what their research shows. The genomes of two species of water bears reveal clues about how they persist in extreme conditions yet don't resolve the animal's debated evolutionary story. See, the most important thing about water bears isn't that they can exist at nearly absolute zero. It isn't that they can exist in outer space. It isn't that they can exist under pressures that uh, are 10 times those at the bottom of the deepest ocean we know. It is that you can't resolve the evolutionary history. That's the burning question that these people are dealing with. But what are water bears? Well, um, to go to the easiest place to explain it, uh, which is Wikipedia. I know, I know. Um, <coughs> tardigrades. They were first discovered by the German zoologist Johann August Ephraim Goetze in 1773. They've been around for a long time. Now that raises an interesting question. How many of you were taught about water bears in biology class? One. Good. Um, they've been around for long enough to have been taught raises an interesting question, why weren't they taught more? Well, anyway, the name tardigrata means slow stepper, was given three days later by the Italian, Italian biologist Lazzaro Spallazzani. They've, they've been known by tardigrata for a long time. Tardigrades are one of the most resilient animals known. Individual species of tardigrades can survive extreme conditions that would be rapidly fatal to nearly all other form, known form, life forms, including complete global mass extinction events. Uh, we've experimented on this, you understand. Uh, due to astrophysical events such as supernovae, gamma ray bursts, or large asteroid impacts. Well, actually we haven't, of course. Uh, we haven't run into any one of those yet, but they have irradiated these things and they can withstand quite a bit of radiation before they die. Some tardigrades can withstand temperatures down to one degree Kelvin. That's minus 272 centigrade or 458 Fahrenheit. That's one degree above absolute zero while others can withstand 420 degrees Kelvin or 300 degrees Fahrenheit. That's, that you can put them in an oven for several minutes. Pressures about six times greater than those found in the deepest ocean trenches, ionizing radiation that doses hundreds of times higher than the lethal dose for a human, and the vacuum of outer space. 
They can go without food or water for more than 30 years, drying out to the point where there are 3% or less water, only to rehydrate, forage, and reproduce. Basically, they form spores, except that the spore is the whole organism. And you can kind of see why they call them water bears. Um, now that particular one is from Wikipedia. There's a couple of other photos of, of these creatures. They, this one is from yahoo.com in an article they wrote. Um, and by the way, if you go and you'll find out that they're all over in terms of where those pictures are from. Um, and just these are the places that I picked them out at. The scientistscott.com has this cute little thing. Uh, look at it, it has kind of these claw-like things and uh, there are six legs here and then two legs behind. So they're eight-legged creatures. Um, here's one where you're seeing it trans, and, and it's hard to see all of the legs because only one of them actually sticks out. But this one is interesting because it's actually not a scanning electron microscope, so it doesn't have color. I mean, it has a little color in it. And uh, you can see that this, this little critter has been eating a little bit of algae. Um, that one, by the way, is from thescientist.com, which is one of the articles we were talking about. Um, and they stole it from uh, Aziz uh, Abu Baker in Edinburgh. And then uh, you can always go with a, a colorized version, if you like, which uh, really makes it cute. Um, uh, and this one is, again, from yahoo.com. Uh, usually tardigrades are about 0 0.5 millimeters. That is about that big. 0 0.02 inches when they are fully grown. They are short and plump with four pairs of legs, each with four to eight claws, also known as discs. The first three pairs of legs are directed ventrolaterally, kind of a little bit out to the side and to the front and are the primary means of locomotion, while the fourth pair is directed posteriorly on the terminal segment of the trunk and is used primarily for grasping the substrate. Tardigrades form the phylum tardigrata, part of the superphyla ectisosa, ectisos, pardon me, ectisozoa. Boy. It is an ancient group with fossils dating from 530 million years ago in the Cambrian period. Water bears are living fossils. About 100,000 100, 150 species of tardigrades have been described. The biggest adults may reach a body length of 1.5 millimeters, and this is why you be careful about trusting um, Wikipedia, because remember that number. The smallest below 0 0.1 millimeter, newly hatched tardigrades may be smaller than 0 0.05 millimeters. Um, tardigrades have barrel-shaped bodies with four pairs of stubby, stubby legs. Most range from 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 millimeters um, in length, although the largest species may reach 1.2 millimeters. Let's go over that again. 1.5 millimeters. Um, the next paragraph, 1.2 millimeters. Who's editing this anyway? Okay, just, just for what it's worth, be careful if when you read Wikipedia. Um, the body consists of a head, three body segments with a pair of legs, and each and a caudal segment with a fourth pair of legs. The legs are without joints, they're just kind of there, while the feet have four to eight claws each. The cuticle, the skin, contains chitin and protein and is molted periodically. Sounds kind of like an insect, doesn't it? Now if you're looking at that, you'd think, well, it must be an arthropod, right? All other tardigrades of the same species have the same number of cells. The big ones and the little ones, the cells are just bigger. Um, 
some species have as many as 40,000 cells in each adult, while others have far fewer. Skipping over a lot of stuff that's interesting, but not germane to what we're going to talk about, tardigrades are able to survive in extreme environments that would kill almost any other animal. Extremes at which tardigrades can survive include those of temperature. Tardigrades can survive a few minutes at 151. Reference. Uh, 30 years at minus 20, or four degrees. Yeah, you put them in ice and 30 years later you come back and you um, uh, hydrate them up properly and they live. A few days at minus 200 degrees centigrade. They can really freeze them. In fact, a few minutes at one degrees Kelvin. Again, you can look it up if you don't trust Wikipedia, and you probably should. Uh, pressure, they can withstand the extremely low pressure of a vacuum and also very high pressures, more than uh, 1,200 times atmospheric pressure. Tardigrades can survive the vacuum of open space and solar radiation combined for at least 10 days. They took them out in space, brought them back in, they lived. Some species can also withstand pressures of 6,000 atmospheres, which is nearly six times the pressure of the water in the deepest ocean trench, the Mariana Trench. Dehydration. The longest the tardi living tardigrades have been shown to survive in a dry state is nearly 10 years. Although there is one report of leg movement, not generally considered survival, in a 120-year-old specimen from dried moss. Yeah, it's in the museum, you know. Somebody, oh, look, at there's one of those things on it. Put it in, and it actually moved when they hydrated it up. When exposed to extremely low temperatures, their body composition goes from 85% water to only 3%. We, as we stand here, are somewhere between 50 and 60% water. As water expands upon freezing, dehydration ensures the tardigrades do not get ripped apart by the freezing ice. So the way to not get killed by freezing is just simply get rid of all the water and you're fine. Tardigrades can withstand 1,000 times more radiation than other animals. Median lethal doses of 5,000 GY of gamma rays and 6,200 GY of heavy ions in hydrated animals. This is not the, the dried out form. This is the hydrated form. Uh, whereas five to 10 GY is fatal to humans. The only explanation found in early experiments for this ability was that their lowered water state provided fewer reactants for ionizing radiation. But this is in the hydrated form. Subsequent researchers found that tardigrades, when hydrated, still remained highly resist resistant to shortwave UV radiation in comparison to other animals. And one factor for this is their ability to efficiently repair damage to their DNA resulting from that exposure. Skipping on, here's some fun stuff that's going to be important for background information. Scientists have dis conducted morphological and molecular studies to understand how tardigrades relate to other lineages through of ectozoan animals. Two plausible placements have been proposed. Tardigrades are either more closely related to arthropoda and onychophora. That's velvet worms. Uh, what's that? Just a minute. Or tardigrades are most closely related to nematodes. C. elegans around worms. Evidence for the former is a common result of morphological studies. Evidence of the latter is found in some molecular analyses. Now stop for just a minute and think. How many of you have been told that the evolutionary tree works for both morphology, how it looks, and for molecular analysis, what its DNA is like? Well, apparently not for water bears. Oh, there's, there's your uh, velvet worms. This one I think is Wikipedia and this one is from YouTube for what it's worth. 
And um, the latter hypothesis uh, that it's uh, most closely related to nematodes has been rejected by recent microRNA and expressed sequence tag analysis. So when they went to dig a little deeper, no, it's not really. Um, and I noticed that I didn't enlarge, that's a reference 63, which by the way does not include this particular reference, although that's probably because it's so new. Apparently the grouping of tardigrades with nematodes found in a number of molecular studies is a long branch attraction artifact. What in the world is a long branch attraction artifact? Well, Actually, it's um, it's uh, kind of a doesn't really mean too much. There, there are two theories as to why long branch attraction might happen. One of them is that you have an organism that splits into two. And then those organisms split into two. And then one of the organisms on each one evolves very uh, considerably. And that leaves these two organisms, which are really, this one is more closely related to this. And this one is more closely related to that, closer to each other than they are to the organisms that have evolved a lot. That's one theory. Another theory is that the organisms are twisting around and evolving in different directions, but they start to converge. And so it's homoplasy or convergent evolution, which uh, kind of like the, um, the ear sensors in bats has evolved to where it's identical to that in dolphins. Um, okay. Uh, of course, if you take out evolutionary theory, then you could say that a creator decided that if bats have to use ultrasound and dolphins have to use ultrasound, why not use the same protein? And so you simply stick it in. Horizontal gene transfer is another one of those that's basically the same thing. Um, skipping on. Um, rare specimens in Cretaceous amber have been found in two North American locations. Melissium Swalensky from New Jersey is the older of the two. Its claws and mouth parts, which are the only really distinguishable parts of the organism, are indistinguishable from the living M. tardigradum. So why don't they call it M. tardigradum? Well, because it's Cretaceous and it has to have evolved a little bit, and so it couldn't be the same species. Um, okay. Now I'm going to finish uh, looking at uh, Wikipedia. Now that you have a little bit of background of the number one, what water bears are. Number two, uh, what the controversy is about. We're going to go to the the press release more or less and the article. The press release is entitled Genomic Analysis Leaves Tardigrade Phylogeny Unclear. Again, notice that the really important part of this is not that we have now discovered how water bears, how some water bears manage to survive in crazy conditions. Um, the really important part is that they don't resolve the animal's debated evolutionary story, and that's what we really need. Where tardigrades belong in the tree of life is a difficult question. Some previous work suggests that these tiny animals that can survive intense environmental challenges are most closely related 
to nematodes, while other studies in the animal's morphology point to arthropods as water bears' nearest relatives. So which is it? Nematodes or arthropods? Now, an international team of scientists has compared detailed genome assemblies of two tardigrade species, while their analysis published today, July 27, 2017, that's why I think it hasn't gotten into Wikipedia as of yesterday, in PLOS Biology sheds light on water bears' ability to endure punishing circumstances, it does not resolve their evolutionary history. Even the full genomes of two tardigrades, which the authors report here, were not sufficient to decide whether tardigrades were closer to arthropods or to the nematodes. Thorsten Burmester, a biologist at the University of Hamburg in Germany who did not participate in the study, so he's presumably objective about this whole thing, writes in an email to the scientist, genome sequences from related phyla which are not yet available may help in the future. So we need more research in this area. So uh, <coughs> can you guys cough up some more tax money for the research? Um, skipping on, Blackster and colleagues wanted to look more closely at the genome of the tardigrave Hypsibius juhardini because previous versions of the animal's genome told conflicting stories. One assembly suggested large amounts of horizontal gene transfer from bacteria, plants, fungi, and archaea, while, the, uh, while others found no such evidence. Well, that's not actually true. The others found about 1% evidence, but, you know, not nearly as much as 10 or 15 or whatever it was, percent. Um, the authors began by sequencing genomic DNA of an individual animal and pooled DNA from about 90,000 tardigrades. They also compared their high quality D. Giudardini uh, genome with that of another tardigrave, uh, Ramatozotius variornatus. There's two different little creatures there. The researchers found that the H. Giudardini genome was nearly twice the size of the R. varionatus. Their analysis of gene sequences indicated that the tardigrades are most closely related to the nematodes, yet an examination of rare genomic changes supported the tardigrade arthropod relationship. The jury is still out, but I think the likely conclusion will be that tardigrades are members of the arthropods as suggested by their morphology, said Max Telford, an evolutionary biologist at University of College of London who is not involved in the work. Careful, careful analysis will resolve this question ultimately, but it is really challenging. We don't know the answer yet. Um, now, I think that it will still turn out to be arthropods because they look like arthropods, they act like arthropods. Well, kind of, at least. Um, their brains are shaped like arthropods. We'll see a, a few comments in a little while. Um, so they really should be closest to arthropods. The authors also determined that only about 1% of the genes in each genome arrive by horizontal gene transfer, much lower than previous estimates. Now, 1% is a lot of genes. Um, they hypothesized that this discrepancy was likely due to contamination with microbial DNA in earlier sequencing attempts, or it, to be more precise, in one earlier sequencing attempt. So yeah, you have to be careful with this stuff. Um, the levels of horizontal gene transfer de detected in the study are much more normal. It's normal to have 1%, 1% of our genes. How many genes do we have? Uh, some estimated 20,000. So that would mean 200 genes of ours would be horizontal gene transfer. Think about that. Um, then what had, what had been previously suggested explains Telford. In a sense, it's slightly disappointing, but I think there's a lesson there. It's good to be suitably skeptical about any extraordinary findings, especially when you don't know what to expect because it's a completely new group of organisms. So, when you see something that comes out and says, ooh, we have the truth in science, 
We've now figured it out. According to these people, take it with a grain of salt. The authors found that some genes associated with desiccation intolerance, by the way, that's their ellipses, looked like they had been horizontally transferred from foreign sources, at least in some species of tardigrades. Boothby did not participate in the work, but studies show, uh, studies how tardigrades survive extremes. So he's, he's into the, how do you do this kind of stuff. Um, some of the genes associated with desiccation intolerance have been horizontally transferred from foreign sources. It raises an interesting question. How do you know that they didn't go from the water bears to the other things? Or how do you know that a designer didn't put it into both because he knew that some roundworms needed to be protected from being dried up too? Because their environment sometimes had lots of water in it and then sometimes they got really dry and so the roundworms had to survive in the dry environment. The most compelling open question for Blaxler focuses on phylogeny and the still unclear relationship between tardigrades, nematodes, and arthropods. We just gotta get this. How did it evolve? Understanding them is going to be very useful for sorting out the history of life in this bit of the animal tree, Blaxler explains. It might seem like a, a bit like bookkeeping, but in fact, if we can sort out these relationship, we've sorted out the relationships of most of the animals on the planet. Well, isn't the tree of life something obvious that really there's no major question about it? We understand how this works? I guess not. Well, let's look at the article itself, since that's where the original uh, authority comes from. Well, actually, it comes from the experiments behind the article. And again, that's available on the web. Tidograta, a phylum of myofaunal organisms, have been at the center of discussions of the evolution of metazoa. This is aimed at resolving a question in evolution. The biology of survival in extreme environments and the role of horizontal gene transfer in animal evolution. Tardigrata are placed as sisters to Arthropoda and Onychophora. That's those little velvet worms you saw. There's some neat videos of velvet worms crawling around if, in case you want. And they look an awful lot like um, uh, centipedes actually uh, in the way they move around. In the superphylum Panarthropoda by morphological analysis, but many molecular phylogenies fail to recover this relationship. This tension between molecular and morphological understandings may be very revealing of the mode and patterns of evolution of major groups. This is a general problem. They're trying to solve a specific case but I thought evolution had it nailed down. Limno-terrestrial tardigrades display extreme cryptobiotic abilities, including anhydrobiosis and cryobiosis, as do deloid rotifers. Oh, there's a whole bunch of nematodes, which are part of the controversy here in terms of evolutionary relationships, and other animals of the water film. So, you could say those animals are, well, they've evolved or they are designed to be able to survive drying up. And still when they're rehydrated, they come back. These extremophile behaviors challenge understanding of normal aqueous physiology. How does a multicellular organism avoid lethal cellular collapse in the absence of liquid water. Well, we know that bacteria do this all the time. They form spores. But 40,000 cells to shrink down somehow. Myofinal species have been reported to have elevated levels of horizontal gene transfer events. 
There's one paper that said that. But how important this is in evolution, and particularly the evolution of extremophile physiology is unclear. To address these questions, we resequenced and reassembled the genome of H. Dujardini, a limnoterrestrial tardigrade that can undergo anhydrobiosis, shrinking down without water, only after extensive pre-exposure to drying conditions. In other words, it takes a while. You have to warn it that the drought is coming, and then it can produce proteins and kind of uh, uh, prepare for the eventual drying out, and compared it to the genome of R. Uh, Variornatus, a related species with tolerance to rapid desiccation. It's sitting there in hay. Suddenly it starts to get dry, it is adapts right there on the spot, doesn't have to make a bunch of new proteins. The two species had contrasting gene expressions responses to anhydrobiosis, drying out, with major transcriptional change in H. Dujardini, but limited regulation in R. variornatus. That we identified few horizontally transferred genes, but some of these were shown to be involved in entry into anhydrobiosis. They're important for part of the animal's function. Whole genome molecular phylogenies supported a tardigrader plus nematoda relationship over tardigrader plus arthropoda. But rare genomic changes tended to support tardigrada uh, plus arthropoda. That's right. It depends on which molecular questions that you are a asking, whether it belongs in one camp or in the other. Tardigrades are justly famous for their abilities to withstand environmental extremes. Many freshwater and terrestrial species can undergo anhydrobiosis, life without water, and thereby withstand desiccation, freezing, and other insults. We, com we explored this comparative biology of anhydrobiosis in two species of tardigrades that differ in the mechanisms they used to enter anhydrobiosis. Using newly assembled and improved genomes. It's interesting. Apparently the abstract isn't good enough anymore. You have to have a summary as well. I always thought that's what the abstract was for, but um, we find that um, our variornatus, a species that can withstand rapid desiccation, differs from H. dujardini, a species that required extensive preconditioning in not showing a major transcriptional response to anhydrobiosis induction. Um, our variornatus is sitting there ready to go. Okay, well, dry me out. See if I care. Whereas Hypsibus has to kind of batten down the hatches before it's ready to go. Um, we identified a number of genetic systems in the tardigrades that likely play conserved central roles in anhydrobiosis as well as species unique components. Compared to previous estimates, our improved genomes show that much reduced levels of horizontal gene, gene transfer into tardigrade genomes. But some of the identified horizontal gene transfer genes appear to be involved in anhydrobiosis. Using the improved genomes, we explored the evolutionary relationships of tardigrades with, and other molting animals, particularly nematodes and arthropods. We identified conflicting signals between sequence-based analyses, which found a relationship between tardigrades and nematodes, and analysis based on rare gene genomic changes, which tended to support the traditional tardigrade arthropod link. Um, the superphylum ectisozoa emerged in the Precambrian, and ectisozoans not only dominated the early Cambrian explosion, but are also are dominant in terms of species, individual, and biomass today. There are more weight of insects than there are weight of uh, mammals. The relationships of the eight phyla within the ectisozoa remain contentious with morphological assessments, developmental analyses, and molecular phylogenetics yielding conflicting signals. So according to the official, or as close to we get, as we get to official in science, comments, there are in fact 
conflicting signals as to whether the water bears belong with the arthropods or do they belong with the nematodes. It has generally been accepted that arthropoda onychophora and targetograva form a monophylum, panarthropoda, and that nematoda roundworms are closely allied to ne nematomorpha horsehair worms and distinct from panarthropoda. However, molecular phylogenies have frequently placed representatives of tardigrade as sisters to nematoda. So this has been known for a long time. Well, as, as long as we've been doing a, a genomic analysis. Invalidating panarthropoda and challenging models of the evolution of complex morphological traits such as segmentation, serially repeated lateral appendages, and the triradiate pharynx and a tripartite central nervous system. <coughs> Skipping over a whole bunch of it. For H. Dujardini, three assemblies have been published. One has low uh, contiguity and contains a high proportion of contaminating non tardigrade sequence, including approximately 40 megabyte, uh, megabases of bacterial sequence and spans 212 megabases. The other two assemblies, both approximately 130 megabases, eliminated most contamination but contained uncollapsed haploid segments because of unrecognized heterozygosity. The animals had two different chromosomes and they had tended to stack the two in sequence rather than realizing that they're in parallel with each other. The initial low quality H. Dujardini genome was published alongside a claim of extensive horizontal gene transfer from bacteria and other taxa in the tardigrade genome and a suggestion that horizontal gene transfer might have contributed to the evolution of cryptobiosis. The extensive HGT horizontal gene transfer claim has been robustly challenged and there's a bunch of references but the debate as to the contribution of horizontal gene transfer to cryptobiosis remains open. Using single co uh, copy orthologs we reanalyzed the position of tardigrade within ecdysozoa and found strong support for a tardigrade plus nematode clade. Well, that's the wrong one. Even when data from transcriptomes of a nematomorph, onychophorans, and other ecdysozoan phyla were included, they, there are ways of trying to figure out, well, how many changes do you have to go from one animal to another and to say that, well, there's a thousand changes here and there's only 200 changes there, and therefore these two are more closely related. But apparently when you do this, water bears turn out to be closely, more closely related to nematodes. However, rare genomic changes, uh, we'll get into exactly what those are in just a bit, tended to support the traditional panarthropoda. Comparisons with Arvarianatus. I'm going to skip over a whole bunch of this article. Fun stuff, but um, dense, hard to read, and most importantly, not having to do with what uh, we're most interested in. There is a figure that is kind of interesting, and this is one uh, tardigrave compared to another tardigrave, and you can see that links between the genomes are kind of all mixed up a little bit. Well, sort of, but you know, if you get into fine stuff, you see if you take this little group right in here, and you take this little group right here, which is the closest relative here, you will notice that even there, the ones that are parallel, um, like this one here got mixed up compared with that one. And this, these ones are in more or less order and then you have two of them that are just kind of shifted. Here's one that's shifted in the reverse direction. So the genomes kind of got mixed up. Now, is that just random stuff or is that designed? And two different designs require slightly, or at least are best done with slightly different orders. I don't know. 
Phylogenetic relationships of tardigrava from the two analysis of protein families shared between H. dujardini, R. varinatus, taxa from other ectisosin phyla, and two lophotrochozoan outgroup taxa. Lophotrochozoans are different enough from all of this stuff that it's presumed that, that they, they are good outside comparison trying to figure out where the tree is in this particular area. Um, one that included only taxa in whole genome data and a second that also included taxa with transcriptome data. That is, how much of this stuff is actually turned into RNA. Although, as we're finding out, 80% uh, of human RNA is transcribed, which raises interesting questions about whether they've been sensitive enough in terms of figuring out what the transcriptome is. We sec selected putative orthologous protein families. So these are same, en same enzyme in a different animal. These were screened to eliminate evident paralogous sequences and alignments were concatenated into supermatrix. The genome's only supermatrix included 322 loci from 28 taxa spanning 67,256 aligned residues and had 12.5% missing data. The alignment was trimmed to remove low quality regions. What are they telling you? They're telling you that this is carefully selected data. This is not just putting those genomes out. You have to trim it here and you have to trim it there and you have to find the ones that are parallel. So. What I want you to take away from this is, this is not simple. This is not something that you would just simply walk into and it's perfectly obvious. When it raises some interesting questions is uh, whether there could be bias in how we're going to select these things. And perhaps systematic bias. First of all, we're selecting ones that are similar to each other and then if we don't have enough similar along the entire range of organisms, well, we have too much missing data, we'll just take that one out too. But, to uh, continue, the genome's only phylogeny strongly supported tardigrada as a sister to monophyletic nematoda. They're related to roundworms. Within nematoda and arthropoda, the relationships of species were congruent with previous analysis. So the rest of the tree is kind of left it alone, but it looks like water bears are related to roundworms, like C. elegans, like some of the parasites. And the earliest branching taxon in ectisozoa was preapulated. Pre that's, that's the way it looks like. The phylogeny derived from the genomes and transcriptomes data set also recovered credibly resolved nematoda and arthropoda. That is, you know, fit the tree otherwise. Um, and as expected, placed nematophora as sister to nematoda. So, yeah, that part fits. Tardigrada was again recovered as sister to nematoda plus nematophora with maximal support. And interestingly, unexpectedly, onychophora, that's those little velvet worms you heard about and saw a couple of examples, represented by three transcriptome data sets, was sister to an arthropoda plus tardigrada nematophora and nematoda clade, again with high support. So what does that mean is that the tree if you use that example, has first nemato nematodes, nematomorpha, uh, uh, the horse hair worms, and then the water bears all together. And then you have the arthropods, and then way out on the other end, you have the velvet worms, which are there's a big division between the velvet worms and the arthropods, but I thought that the arthropods and the velvet worms were supposed to be pretty securely together. Apparently not. At least if you believe the uh, molecular data. Rare genomic changes in tardigraves. Um, 
these are the ones that tried to put the uh, the water bears in with the arthropods, insects, crustaceans, etc. Um, rare genomic changes. One of them was in Hox genes, which I won't get into too much, although it wasn't terribly convincing, as you will find out. Gene family birth can be used as another rare genomic marker. This is gene family birth. That means you've got brand new gene families. We analyzed the whole proteomes of ecdysozoan taxa for gene family births that supported either the tardigrada plus nematoda model or the tardigrada plus arthropoda, the panarthropoda model. The two tardigrades sh shared more gene families with arthropoda than they did with ne nematoda. We found six gene families present that had members in both tardigrades and all 14 arthropods under panarthropoda, but no gene families were found in both tardigrades and all nine nematodes under the other hypothesis. Discussion. A robust estimate of the H. Dujardini genome. Skipping down, HDT in tardigraves, H. Dujardini has a normal metazone genome, contrasting modes of anhydrobiosis in tardigrades, and the position of tardigrades in the metazoa. Our, phylogenetic, our phylogenomic analysis found tardigrada represented by H. Dujardini and R. varianatus genomes, as well as transcriptomic data from uh, M. tardigradium and Echiniscus testudo, that's the turtle um, uh, water bear, kind of looks vaguely like a turtle, uh, to be sisters to nematoda, not arthropoda. This finding was robust to the inclusion of additional phyla such as onychophora and nematophora. A parmenian metamorpha, and to filtering the alignment data to exclude poorly represented or rapidly evolving loci. Boy, you chop off stuff and it's still related. This finding is both surprising and not new. Why is it surprising? Because this is not what we wanted. But it's been known for a long time. And this is another confirmation of it. Many previous molecular analysis have found tardigrada to group with nematoda. Whether using single genes or ever larger gene sets derived from transcriptome and genome studies. It looks like it belongs with the roundworms. But it doesn't look like it belongs with the roundworms. This phenomenon has been attributed to long branch attraction whatever that is, in suboptimal data sets, so maybe if we get more data we can re resolve this, with elevated substitutional rates or biased compositions in nematoda and tardigrada mutually and robustly driving Bayesian and maximum likelihood algorithms to support the wrong tree. The wrong tree? If you're an evolutionist, I guess there's a right tree and a wrong tree. <laughs> Developmental and anatomical data do not, in general, support a tree linking tardigrada with nematoda. You see? Tardigrades are segmented. They have appendages and have a central and peripheral nervous system anatomy that can be homologized with those of onychophora, the velvet worms, and arthropoda. They, their internal structure is like arthropods and like velvet worms. In contrast, nematodes are unsegmented, have no lateral appendages, and have a simple nervous system. Water bears just have to be with arthropods, but that's not what the molecular data is telling us. H. Dujardini has a reduced complement of Hox loci, as does R. varianatus. Some of the Hox loci missing in the tardigrada are the same as those missing from nematoda. They must have arrived at it by different methods because otherwise they would be related to nematodes and everybody knows they're not related to nematodes, or at least not closely. 
Whether these absences are a syn synapomorphy for a nematode tardigrade clade or simply a product of homoplasious evolution remains unclear. Homoplasious evolution, that's convergent evolution. It means independently they evolved the same structure. Assembl assessment of gene family births as rare genomic changes less support to a tardigradipus arthropoda clade. <sighs> Finally. But the support was not striking. Still looks like it's a nematode, but you know it can't be. We note that recognition of gene families may be compromised by the same long branch attraction issues that plague phylogenetic al analysis, that plague phylogenetic analysis. This happens all the time. Issues, uh, let's see, and that also that any taxon in which gene loss is common, such as been proposed for nematode as a result of its simplified body plan. So the nematodes were originally more complex than they are now. Degeneration, yes, may score poorly in gene family membership metrics. You can't do the, the molecular analysis, the, the information is corrupted and so it messes you up. The question of tardigrade relationship remains open. It doesn't make sense. It should be the nematode, I mean it should be the arthropods, but it looks like it's the nematodes, so we'll just say we don't know. Well, we found support for a clad of tardigrada, anicophora, arthropoda, nematoda, and nematomorpha. The branching order within this group remains contentious. And in particular, the positions of tardigrade and anicophora are poorly supported and or variable in ours and others' analysis. Resolution of the conflicts between morphological and molecular data will be informative. And I'm gonna, that's, then they get into the methods and we've, we've done enough for one day, I think. My own view on this is there's conflicting data on whether water bears are more like arthropods or more like roundworms. There, this is a problem if one must fit water bears into an evolutionary tree. And you have to fit it into an evolutionary tree if you're gonna believe the evolutionary story. A lot of effort is expended in trying to solve this problem. Some of the effort is used in trying to prove that analysis whose results we like are more important than analysis whose results we do not like. If one allows for a creative designer, the problem disappears. God just simply takes some stuff from here, some stuff from there, puts it together, and he says, I got a new creature now. A design approach refocuses effort from trying to fit water bears into a tree into trying to understand the design features that allow water bears to survive without water. One can marvel at how new genes and genes repurposed from distantly related life forms are used to solve dis difficult engineering problems and try to ask questions about it. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Comment down here. I'm curious how many folks had ever even heard of a water bear before today, number one. And number two, uh, when they do analysis between our chromosomes and the water bears, they may discover that we and they share 70% uh, uh, That depends on how you count it. Uh, I, I know that we have one person who had heard of water bears before this. Um, how many others heard of water bears before? One, two, three, four, a uh, distinctly minority. Yes. Uh, this is just another example of what's been going on for at least the past 20 years. When they started sequencing DNA. Yes. Uh, they thought it was going to solve evolutionary questions of relationships. It is, but it's solving them in the wrong way. And it, it, <laughs> and it turns out that 
sequencing is not helping phylogen phylogenical questions at all. Or maybe uh, it is. Uh, Just they don't want to hear the answer. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> if they if they allow for design in the picture, which, uh, but uh, science is a restricted view of reality, and so it won't allow God or Creator in the picture. So they have to play these games here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the thing of it is, this is just one example. It's just one example, I'm telling you. This has been going on for 20 years. And uh, they won't give up on the, uh, on the evolution concept. No. Uh, because, no, you're not a scientist if you think there's a creator, or at least you don't want to think that way. Yeah. Uh, but it's uh, just an example of, you know, there's another nail in the coffin of evolution. The story certainly isn't coherent with overwhelming evidence in support of it. I mean, it's, it's so, these things look so much like an arthropod. I mean, they're... They've they got to be arthropods, except that when you examine them, you find out that they're mostly nematodes. They're a roundworm. They're really a roundworm, you know. That, uh, maybe they were designed. Might, might think about that. Other what about the moss piglets they were talking about? Oh, they ma like them, moss piglet is just another name for what? water bear, okay. which is another name for tardigrade. Okay. I was just curious about that. Yeah. And that's one of the things you have to keep in mind is that, you know, it's like puma and panther and mountain lion, and they're all the same creature. I think there's also painter, which is the same creature, depending on where you first run into it. So, yeah, one of the things you have to do eventually is to kind of sort through the terminology. And as you found out, uh, you get one species name if you find it today. You get another species name if you find the exact same animal in the Cretaceous. Mm -hmm. The exact well, same animal. This is this is a basic problem in taxonomy that uh, uh, needs to be wrestled with by the scientific community. What is a species? A lot of those species out there, they have no reason to call them species. They, they find a fossil of a certain shape and find another one with the same shape with some spines on it. And they, of course, call it different species. Yeah. Not realizing that animals do this uh, some more, uh, uh -huh. models but to do this all the time. Can you tell me what Canis domesticus looks like? <laughs> <laughs> One species and um, some adults are what, that high and some adults are that high and, when and some are skinny and fat, and, and, and that's the way they grow. I mean, you don't, have to, you don't have to force them to be that way. When you're told there are so many species out there, be careful about those figures. Uh, realize that a scientist, when he sees a, an extra uh, hair or two on a fly, ah, this is different. New species, and he gets to tag his name on as, a, as the originator of that species. Uh, this has gone on for too long. Well, but it's going to continue going on because, after all, speciation is supposed to be a vague thing. There's no actual line, you know. There, there are no rules to speak of uh, to tell you where you draw the line here. It's a line in the sand, of course, because there's too much variability there. Yeah. Hey. That's why uh, you really, when people say, well, macroevolution is the same as microevolution, well, it depends on which macroevolution you're talking about. Some macroevolution may extend to the family, as far as I know. One person's family can be another person's order, can be another person's class. Uh, it's, taxonomy is very subjective science. 
Uh, comment here. Where can we go to find these creatures? I'm sorry? Where, where can we find some of these creatures? Uh, All over. Uh, uh, between sand grains mostly. That's where you can find them. Uh, but uh, the, you can find them in the Antarctic. You can find them in, uh, uh, in all kinds of crazy places because they survive so well. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of them live between sand grains at the seashore. And, you know, it's like little bitty things that, that unless you get a hand lens down, you're not going to even see them. Less than a millimeter long. You're going to look like a little dot. And in the midst of gazillions of other dots, you, you know, on the seashore, you just kind of, oh well, a little more sand there. Until you, until you magnify them enough and you see that the little <laughs> legs are actually moving and they look like kind of cute little bears except that somebody uh, kept putting legs on them. Uh, what's the purpose for the water bear? <laughs> you know, I, I wonder sometimes if the creator simply uh, liked variety and so he just did all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, uh, I don't know that there's... Uh, there, there is one theory that they are... Uh, they, as an animal, are sometimes the first to get into an environment and therefore lend help to the food supply. Um, whether that's a viable uh, uh, purpose for them, uh, maybe they're there just to prove that evolution doesn't work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. I think God has a sense of humor. Look at all the different variety, looking at just grapes. There's over you know, 2,000 variety of grapes, and each of those has a different taste to it, a different uh, flavor to it, a different way to the palate to when you chew on it, has a different type of fiber to it. And that's just for grapes alone. And look at all the other fruits we have, and then we've got vegetables and all these. And when uh, I set up my uh, saltwater aquarium, it took uh, a month for the rocks and everything else in there to become acclimatized so that a, uh, the, sea, the normal saltwater fish would survive. And so we had you know, just the, uh, these funny little guppy fish to just kind of start, start a, you know, getting it to civilize. And I'm wondering whether some of these little water bears, maybe some of the little creatures that are part of the food supply of some of these other saltwater fish uh, that that they had to uh, form a, their colonies before uh, mm -hmm. the uh, regular saltwater fish would have enough to uh, survive on and eat on. Well, I guess one of the things you could say is that supposedly we are going to be studying stuff throughout eternity and maybe, you know, when we get to three million plus years and we're bored with some of the other stuff, I, water bears will be a nice little break. <laughs> In the meantime, um, did you have... No, I'm just going to say, they could be useful scavengers uh, in the cycle of, uh, of life, you know, like uh, plants recycle stuff. These may help in that. Sure. Um, Yes, come in here. Sorry, just a quick idea. Is it possible that they could be used as toxic cleanup? Because if they can survive so much stuff that we've thrown at them, is it possible when they go into a new environment they could uh, stabilize it and clean it for other more sensitive items to come in? Uh, that's a possibility. Have they ever tried seeing if they put it into an environment that has been uh, irradiated to see if they can make any change to it? That's an interesting question. I, I think that somebody has suggested uh, something similar to that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it 
made its way into Wikipedia. I just didn't cover that in in uh, in depth. Because I mean, it would be interesting to take them and put them in some place like the Chernobyl site, because we've already seen other animals have been able to to grow and and, and change mm -hmm. there. Is it possible that by introducing that into a, a, a circumstance like that, they could maybe magnify the the recovery rate of the the area because might, I mean God has created the earth as a symbiotic organism to yeah. recover from certain things at some point we ca the earth can't because yeah. it just gets to be a big enough injury but yeah well not only that but the plan of salvation was laid from the foundation of the earth according to uh, uh, right. scripture and that means that not just the plan of Jesus coming to die for us but also the plan of having animals survive in a dog-eat-dog -dog world, which is what we put them into. Well, that and also in a world where, I mean, I think somewhere in Scripture it says that we have the power to destroy the earth. And so maybe God created something that could help counteract that, at least for a little bit, till the plan of salvation could come to fruition, and then he can come. Yeah. But anyway. That God didn't want to be, have an environment that was so fragile that at our first sin the whole thing would fall apart. Exactly. Well, I mean, I look at humans. We are 6,000 years of sin and degradation and we still have gorgeous, we still have the capacity to give birth to beautiful progeny in, in one way or another. And it's just amazing that after 6,000 years we can still do that. Yes. Yeah. It's, yeah. It, for me it's amazing. But anyway, sorry. No. No, nothing to be sorry about. Well, come back next week and we'll look at protein in dinosaur tissue. 65 million years and above. <laughs>